starting to record. Okay. Shall I introduce myself? Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, we're going to start the conference. So we have Dr. Baltar, who is kind enough to come uh, to us to talk about one of the emerging toxicity that we're going to see, an epidemic that is partly our fault as well. So please uh, have you uh, heard undivided attention. Thank you. Okay, so hello. So I recognize, a, can you hear me? Does that, I recognize a few staff, but who, so are the rest of you fellows? Just raise your hands. Are you MICU fellows or surgical? Okay, so I mean, there's a whole crop of you that I haven't met uh, uh, for a while. So, um, so today I thought I'd talk to you. I'm, I'm a, by the way, a medical toxicologist who here at Henry Ford and the uh, Children's Hospital of Michigan Regional Poison Center. Uh, and I've been doing that for at least 30 years, the whole shot. So if you have consults in the MICU, some of you we've worked together, others you're welcome to call me for anything complicated or even uncomplicated. So I thought I would talk to you today about uh, an, a current drug trend that's really sweeping the big cities of America, including our Detroit metro area. And for people like myself, and I see Dr. Kvali here, I haven't seen you in a while. This is kind of shades of the 70s and early 80s where heroin was big. And then we had all these stimulants, cocaine, stimulants, and prescription abuse. And now we're back to heroin again. We have another heroin epidemic going on. So there's a lot of this that reminds me of and just brings back a lot of deja vu as to the days where we used to treat heroin overdose, but we now have a little bit of a different understanding and a different approach than we did back then. So just, just for, for demographic purposes, um, the death rates from prescription opioids and heroin have increased fivefold since 1999. And as you guys know, the prescription opioid epidemic uh, was recognized around 2008 and, and found that the, drug, the CDC and national statistics showed that drug over, overdose deaths are, have become the leading cause of injury death, even more than trauma. And for example, in 2014, you can see that, pr that prescription opioid deaths, these are raw numbers, uh, still superseded heroin deaths, but that is kind of quickly uh, equalizing, and, and uh, heroin deaths are increasing. So since 2010, heroin use and overdose has been increasing in the U.S., and deaths have tripled, especially between the years of 2013 and 2014, for which there are be better statistics. Heroin uh, overdose, de overdose deaths increased uh, by 26 percent. And also, there's another phenomenon going on, the death rates from synthetic opioids, mainly fentanyl, these are synthetic opioids excluding methadone, have increased by 80 percent. So this new opioid epidemic, it's like an epidemic in an epidemic in an epidemic. There's a there was a prescription epidemic going on, and within there arose a heroin epidemic, and now a synthetic opioid epidemic is happening. So, so this initially, this prescription opioid epidemic ha seems to be driving the current heroin epidemic, as um, Dr. Abrancilio mentioned. All right. Uh, some of the reasons are thought to be that now, because there's such a squeeze onto prescribing uh, opioids, there are a lot of restrictions, amounts, uh, types of agents given, changes of, pay of dealing with pain, not using opioids, and prescription opioids are more expensive than some of the street heroin now, and new formulations are being made, like for example OxyContin and Oxymorphone or Opana, where they're tamper resistant, where the user can no longer crush those and shoot them or snort them. Um, and opioid substitutes, which are big like Suboxone, they're very expensive too, and that you have to have a designated, a prescriber that is trained and certified in order to prescribe these. So there's a lot of limitations on treating uh, dependence and addiction. And so the, the patients who have become addicted through the opioid epidemic or other reasons have become tolerant to opioids and they're seeking uh, to substitute with heroin and, and many times with even more potent opioids and the people who are, who are providing the heroin uh, recognize this and are u u using um, uh, patients uh, to promote their financial uh, interests. So worldwide, this is not just the case in the United States, but this is a worldwide phenomenon where uh, there is a trend to abuse potent and undetect laboratory-wise undetectable opioids, and it is emerging. So you know, we in the last uh, 10 to 20 years, we talked about synthetic 
uh, synthetic stimulants, synthetic cannabinoids, and now we're back to talking now about synthetic opioids. So what are some of these agents, just as a start? So much of the heroin that's out there, in fact, the majority of it is probably tainted with a fentanyl or fentanyl analog. And it may be tainted with other opioids too, but the most common one is fentanyl. Uh, acetyl fentanyl is, is very popular now and people are writing about it. There are other structurally similar uh, fentanyls out there as well, but acetyl fentanyl, then of course the carfentanyl, which is very deadly, and a newer opioid, U7700 called pink or U4, is another potent opioid that's out there. And I love this picture because it shows you the potency of these opioids. Look at morphine, how tiny it is. Everything is compared to morphine. And here's heroin, and here's fentanyl, and here's the elephant in the room is carfentanyl. Look how much more potent it is than morphine. And we're, not, we're also seeing different geographic distributions of users because it's no longer just heroin users, powder users. These agents are being put into counterfeit pills and capsules, and they're sold uh, as Oxy, as Narco, as Xanax, all the things that the prescription opioid group of people uh, uh, use, and they buy very often on the street because they're expensive otherwise or they don't have access to their doctors. And so there's many, there are many reports in the emergency and in the toxicology literature of patients uh, thinking that they're buying a prescription opioid and they're actually getting fentanyl or, uh, or, U4, or U4 as it's known in the pill and having a dramatic reaction that they didn't expect. In fact, uh, if you follow the news prints, the pop singer, they showed that he, that he had um, fentanyl in his body and everybody you know, was like, what's going on? And they still don't know, but they found that he had narco pills uh, in his home and they were actually fentanyl pills. And there's some speculation that there might have been the U4 in there too. So where do these synthetic opioids come from? Well, nobody knows, but there, there are a lot of, like, the CDC, the DEA, um, and a lot of news documentaries suggest that the chemicals, the precursor chemicals that are used to make these agents come from China, where these agents are not regulated, these chemicals are not regulated, and they're purchased on what's called the dark net. For many of you who aren't familiar, this is a great picture. You know, I'm not that familiar with the dark net either, but here are all our usual search engines. Here's like the deep web with medical records and other things, and then you have this dark web way down here where people can't really access it. It's not discoverable. They send it back and forth and back and forth, whatever the IT people do, the tech technical people do, so you can't discover it. And you buy, you buy stuff on this web by a special kind of currency, which has many names, but maybe you've heard the word Bitcoin. So it, it's very deep and dark and, and, and undiscoverable. And so there's a lot of this going on with these synthetics, as well as other uh, black market type trading. So this, this issue has become very important nationally. And here's just an example of how, um, how big a problem it is and that the CDC in the middle of last uh, summer in July, when the problem's coming to a real head, sent out what's called a HAN or a health alert network. They wanted to alert healthcare professionals to new developments that place people at risk for fatal and non-fatal fentanyl overdoses from illicitly manufactured fentanyl, that they're available in these counterfeit pills that we just talked about, that there are new geographic borders for users, and that the potency of not just fentanyl, but all these analogs of fentanyl is really evolving and getting stronger. And they urged the medical community to improve detection of outbreaks uh, by surveillance. That includes emergency departments, EMS poison centers and of course P physicians, primary physicians and intensive care physicians and also urging them to expand the use of naloxone uh, to, uh, in terms of immediate treatment and approaches to immediate treatment and then to uh, expand naloxone access to the layperson to people who are using to prevent deaths. This up here is a counterfeit OxyContin 80 milligrams. This is the real one and this is the counterfeit. So it has similarity, but you can see the color difference, et cetera, but for people who are buying these on the street, they barely pay attention, and they often get something they didn't expect. So I have some interesting data from, to show you that this is real. I have some data from our Wayne, medical, uh, Wayne County Medical Examiner in terms of the deaths from various opioids and opiates 
uh, in the last couple of years. I also have, we've been collecting some data in the ED, not of deaths, but of exposures in the last couple of years that I'll show you. So this is a real phenomenon. So these are the number of drug-related deaths um, in Wayne County between these years. So you can see the, um, the, the blue is 2013, 2014, 15, and 16. You can see here heroin, fentanyl, other opioids, cocaine. Look in 2016 what a dramatic rise there is even over heroin, okay? And comparatively to the other, to the other years and to the other drugs. The percentage of death, these are, by the way, deaths. Uh, th what I just showed you were the deaths in Wayne County for those years. The percentage of deaths caused by select classes of these opioids are, look, fentanyl, 50%, heroin, 38%, cocaine, other opioids, uh, benzos and muscle relaxants, and carfentanil is starting to show its head at the end of last year. Okay, so very real phenomenon of heroin and heroin mixed with synthetics and then the synthetics. So um, here are the temporal trends, something that we observed in the ED, and you probably observed if you've got any of these patients in, in the unit, although many of them don't go to the unit. They either die outside or they, when they come and they're revivable, uh, unless they have an oxycencephalopathy or some kind of pulmonary edema, they usually get discharged from the emergency department or leave AMA is a typical, typical pattern. But you can see that the fentanyl, the end of the year was when we started to see, see things mostly. September, October, November, December, fentanyl, look at the rising peaks here. This is by month. This is by month heroin, cocaine. Everything was rising toward the end of the year, and now in 2017, we're getting another peak in the first three months. So the percentage, this is also interesting, again, this is all Wayne County medical examiner data on deaths. The percentage of deaths in different age categories, interesting, whites and blacks, uh, here are Latinos and Arab Americans, um, but the whites, look at the younger age group here, and, and in the blacks is the older age group, age 55 to 64, which is probably a reflection of most of the population in Detroit that were heroin users all their life, right? And now they're an aging heroin population, and they're still using, um, and now they're probably dying significantly more because they're not used to these newer synthetic and more potent heroin. So demographics are interesting. This is our preliminary data, not for deaths, but for heroin overdose patients. Um, just anybody with a diagnosis of heroin overdose or poisoning that was presented to our emergency department. Here's 2014. These are numbers of patients. 2015, 16, you can see these are the months here. In July, August, you can see it started to rise, 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 and we have had more cases per month until uh, even uh, January, February, and here's a little lull here in March of last year. So we're seeing the same kind of, we're seeing the, the users, not necessarily the deaths in the same, reflecting the same type of demographic of the deaths that are being seen. So in 2014, 80 patients, 134, 287, and in two, 2016, we had 287 patients that were purported heroin. There's nowhere to code fentanyl or carfentanil. They all fall under the category of heroin. And in the first three months, we've had 88 patients already. Okay, so I'm going to throw in a little opiate stuff in here as well, not just the synthetics. But So if you recall, um, opium is the dried extract of the poppy plant. And here's the poppy, poppy um, uh, plant called Papav Papaver somniferum. And it, so it's that, that white latex stuff that comes out of the plant, which is about, it has many alkaloids in it. The most, the most popular, of course, is morphine. It's about 10% morphine, which is the raw material for heroin. It also contains codeine, which is the raw material for the synthesis of hydrocodone, hydromorphone, and has also got something called thebane, which is the raw material for oxycodone. And this is kind of important because just remember this, you know how they say you just remember a few things from every lecture. Uh, this is important because this impacts then on our lab testing, for example, like where the opiate comes from. Not all opioids or opiates are going to show up in your urine drug screens that you have, and it has basically to do with their similarity to morphine, codeine, or thebane in terms of, of what you will be able to pick up. So that's where, so, so that's the famous poppy. Of course, it's 
it's uh, hard to work a poppy field to grow it, to harvest it, you know, to get all the heroin out of it. So when these synthetics, they're made in labs. So it's a lot easier for these, these uh, producers and black market guys to make synthetic uh, opioids than to harvest fields and try to skirt uh, all kinds of law enforcement and everybody. So it's become very popular to go in that direction. So here I'm just reviewing for you, again, the metabolism of heroin and codeine, which are the natural uh, alkaloids found in the poppy, in the opium poppy. You can see here's morphine, okay? Here's codeine. So codeine is demethylated by the help of CYP2D6 to morphine. And um, many people down here on the bottom, 7% 7 of the white population does not have this functional CYP enzyme. So they can't convert codeine to morphine. And the way uh, codeine gives you analgesia is through its conversion to morphine. So therefore, some people will tell you, I don't get anything from Tylenol-3. And you say, well, you're, you're full of whatever. You're just a drug user. You shouldn't think like that about everybody. You should be selective who you think that about, because there is truly a portion of people who will not convert codeine to morphine, and they don't get any analgesic effect from, from their Tylenol-3. Heroin is semi-synthetic. Heroin is not a natural alkaloid in the poppy. Heroin is actually made from morphine. It is exogenously, exogenously synthesized from morphine. Uh, humans can't acetylate morphine, and heroin is diacetylmorphine, but they can deacetylate it. They can deacetylate uh, heroin. So heroin is, the alkaloid's taken out, it's acetylated, heroin is made, and then heroin metabolism from diacetylmorphine, which is heroin, goes to monoacetyl morphine and then back to, is hydrolyzed by pseudocholinesterase, back to morphine. And this is where uh, its, its euphoric effects come from, as well as this metabolite, this monoacetyl morphine metabolite, which is called 6-MAM, M-A-M. That is very specific for just heroin. So when people are, are, you know, you're looking for drug screens and looking, okay, they're positive for opiates, uh, how do you know that that's heroin, not morphine or codeine? Well, we don't test specifically on our screens here, but law enforcement and other special labs to prove that it was heroin uh, for various legal purposes and other, they have to check for this particular metabolite, 6-MAM, which has a very, very narrow uh, uh, half-life in the human. So it's, it's hard to find, but that's, that's the ultimate way to say that this was truly a heroin exposure, not something else. So this little metabolic pathway is kind of important for you. Okay, six mam is, is specific. Okay, so what, what about the terms opiate and opioid? Opiates are the natural alkaloids derived from the poppy plant, which are morphine, codeine, thebane. Opioids are compounds that not, are not necessarily structurally the same, but they bind to the opioid receptors and produce opioid effects. Semi synthetic opioids are modified opiates. All right, so heroin is actually a semi synthetic opioid. Um, it, hydrocodone, again, the raw material is codeine for hydrocodone, hydromorphone, etc. So they're modified opiates, whereas synthetic opioids are completely synthesized opioids. And their examples, of course, are uh, methadone, tramadol, fentanyl, carfentanil, etc. Again, that becomes very important when you're looking at your drug screens, trying to interpret what is going to be positive. <laughs> and so, um, Okay, I'm not going to go too much through this, but as you know, they're traditionally, they've all been renamed, but they're traditionally three major opiate receptors, of which the mu receptor is the most important. It gives us pretty much the opiate toxidrome uh, and the euphoric effects, um, so suffice it to say that that is the most important. And all these synthetic opioids act strongly on the mu receptor. So in general, opiates are, can, you can look at them, opioids, opiates are depressant analgesics with psychoactive properties. And they do promote their psychoactive euphoric properties indirectly by promoting dopamine release, which all psychoactive substances do. They work through release of dopamine and dopaminergic effects. So this is the famous opioid toxidrome, which all of you know. But just to review, we, we use toxidromes in toxicology. We look for pure toxidromes, for combination toxidromes, CNS depression, coma, meiosis, respiratory depression, in severe cases, bradycardia and hypotension, ileus, hyporeflexia, and of course, ultimately, cardiac arrest if they've had a significant respiratory arrest. So which opioids cause medriasis? We talk about meiosis. Anybody know? Which, there are a few opioids that they will fool you that cause medriasis, not meiosis. Did you say something? Pardon? No. 
They're actually more, more traditional <coughs> opioids. Anybody? Okay, meparidine, you don't use it anymore. Demerol has a strong anticholinergic effect, so they, you actually see people with large pupils. Tramadol has a, um, is strongly serotonergic, and serotonin effects will give you large pupils, so tramadol. And then there's an, a famous, you know, Lomodal that you know is a GI prep that it c contains the opioid diphenoxalate and atropine. So when somebody ingests it, they actually get the atropine effect first, so they get medriasis first. So there's some foolers out there. Okay. So what, what is the remaining? We have the opioid toxidrome. We know that respiratory depression with opioids is the major cause of death. It's mediated by mu receptors in the medullary chemoreceptive zone. It, they decrease sensitivity to hypercarbia and depress the ventilatory response to hypoxia. Um, additionally, pulmonary injury can occur because of aspiration, because of mental status problems or vomiting, or if somebody's injecting as they used to, they don't inject much, but they used to inject up in their neck, they would, we would see uh, pneumothorax, which you could completely miss if you're not thinking about it. And not just from injection, but from heavy insufflation when they valsalva, they can actually burst a bleb or something and, and get to. So, and most ICU admissions are uh, from these agents are due to aspiration aspiration and acute lung injury and hypoxia uh, and sometimes sepsis. So, so respiratory complications of opioid use are very big. There's also a condition called that's been known and called many years non-cardiac opioid induced non-cardiac pulmonary edema. It's basically a form of acute lung injury or ARDS but it was initially, initially reported in the 70s. At the time the heroin users were different than the heroin was different. It was very very dirty, it wasn't highly pure, had a lot, of, um, a lot of contaminants in it, and it was almost all IV use. Uh, but that's when the whole thing came to being, that, that, uh, that, that this is a specifically heroin or narcotic-induced uh, non-cardiac pulmonary edema, and its incidence has decreased over the years. Maybe it's due to heroin purity, maybe not. We still do see it every once in a while, and there are a lot of theories as to what causes it, but um, the one thing that is secure in this is the patient who does develop this usually develops it within the first several hours, and usually hypoxia, persistent hypoxia, is always present. Um, a gentleman named Sporer looked at 27 cases in the 90s when there was somewhat of a resurgence of this non-cardiac pulmonary edema, um, where patients were tachypnic and hypoxic on arrival or became that way within four hours. Their chest, chest x-rays all showed bilateral pulmonary edema, and most of them resolved with just oxygen. Some had to be intubated, um, and or, uh, at that time they really weren't using your BiPAP masks or CPAP masks much. Yes? You know, that, that's one of the theories, which is the next slide. The mechanism, interestingly, still has not been determined. Um, Naloxone-related is one of the theories, but most people, most, most um, toxicologists don't feel that that's the case. The, uh, most people feel that because this occurs in patients who have really severe respiratory depression, often apnea, that the hypoxia itself increases capillary permeability and causes this. Um, Naloxone-induced catechol excess, which can affect the myocardium, um, it, it is, has been thrown around as a theory. Uh, but the cases that are described have happened with and without naloxone even before, uh, before anybody has administered naloxone. So that's still a potential theory, and there are papers to suggest that it could be, but it has not been determined. Negative pressure pulmonary edema, people are, are breathing against a, a glottis that's not moving when they're uh, uh, near apneic from their uh, overdose, which could draw fluid into the alveolar space. Those are like the main three theories that still have not been proven. My personal interest is to, with Dr. Moore back there, I've talked to him, is to try to do ultrasounds on these patients that have, uh, that come in with heroin overdose or pulmonary edema to see if they have a form of stress cardiomyopathy perhaps, like a Takotsubo type. But that, that's just, you know, a theory. So the management of these is just like your any other pulmonary edema. Um, you want to use oxygen, positive pressure, ventilation, unless they're very uptunded. I mean, if they're very uptunded, then you really can't. But if they're awake and they just have pulmonary edema, you could try non-invasive. And there have been some cases where they were severe enough to need ECMO. Um, but one of the ways, and going back to Dr. Rivers' question, is in general, you know, one of the things that potentially supports the possibility of naloxone-related induced pulmonary edema is that 
Uh, we used to use huge doses in the past, and now everybody's into lower doses, and perhaps that has cut down on what's been happening. It's very unclear. Okay, the cardiovascular toxicity, uh, opioids cause hypotension, veno-arterial dilation, histamine release. Um, the cutting agents can have something to do with it, and they can get bradycardic. So they also have some conduction problems. So which opioid is a potassium channel blocker and prolongs the QT? You know this one. Good. Methadone? Any other? Loperamide or Imodium. I'm sure you've heard and read about quite a bit what people are presenting with Torsad from using Imodium, which I want to say something about that at the end, which I see I'm running out of time. Which opioid is a, ch a sodium channel blocker and causes QRS prolong prolongation, propoxyphene? Are there opioids that cause seizures? Yes, there are. It's not the typical part of the toxidrome. Tramadol does. Meparidine does. Propoxyphene. These all can cause seizures, can trip you to say that this is a non-opioid presentation. And of course, if a patient develops hypoxia and hypoxic encephalopathy after an overdose. And which opioids can cause serotonin syndrome, which inhibit 5-HT uh, reuptake? Very important. Anybody re remember who, which, which opioids have serotonergic effects? Excellent. Dextromethorphan. There you go. Dextromethorphan, tramadol, and meparidine. And meparidine we hardly use, but tramadol, when, when people come in opioid, you give them naloxone, very often they will then present with rigidity, hyperreflexia. They look like a serotonin syndrome. So it's very, very interesting as well as dextromethorphan. All right, so moving on. So those, the general review of opioids. Moving on to some of the synthetic opioids. This is our morphine, uh, or excuse me, our heroin diacetylmorphine structure, very much like morphine. Fentanyl, carfentanyl, they all have different structures. The more methyl groups they have on them, apparently the better they are to get into the brain and cause psychoactive effects. So fentanyl and its derivatives, very popular now, um, adulterating heroin. Look at the potency. So, so it's a... Fentanyl is 50 times the potency of heroin and 80 times the potency of morphine with tight binding to the opiate receptor. This is a great picture because these two amounts here of heroin and fentanyl are supposed to be equivalent. Look at the tiny amount of fentanyl. And so the person can, so these guys who make this stuff can put a tiny little bit of fentanyl and already remove the heroin and they've got a strong effect. Or if they put too much, which is, there's no quality control in this, just a little bit too much fentanyl can kill a person who's used to using a specific amount of heroin. So street heroin is pretty much all adulterated with fentanyl. One gram of pure fentanyl can be, one gram can be cut into approximately 7,000 doses for street sale. It is prevalent in Michigan, and now a new analog, which is more psychoactive, um, acetylfentanyl, is very popular now, which is 15 times the potency of morphine. This is, this is fentanyl in Michigan. This was fentanyl seized by the Michigan State Police, Michigan Intelligence Operations Center. They found this, they were raiding a house, and they found all these little packets of fentanyl there, these tiny little packets. Acetylfentanyl, see the similar, similar structure, except here you have a, a change here by the acetyl group. Um, so it, fentanyl, by the way, if you uh, remember, um, pharmaceutical fentanyl, can also be abused and has been abused, as you know. And patches, fentanyl or dergesic patches, have been abused as well. In particular, the transdermal patch where you can see that it has a little drug reservoir in here. And they just take a little tiny needle, draw out the fluid, cook it up, that vaporize it into a white powder, and it's ready to go for injection or, or intranasal insufflation. Uh, some people put multiple patches on themselves. Some people eat the patches. There's a whole culture of people abusing this is now pharmaceutical fentanyl, whereas the illicit fentanyl is non-pharmaceutical, and they can tell structurally, a uh, forensic analysis can tell. Street Norco, this is Norco. Watson is a company that makes the, the majority of famous Norco. This is a Norco tablet. Um, and uh, Street Norco has been containing fentanyl. Now they've been selling it, as I mentioned. OxyContin, Norco, Xanax are... Uh, are substituted or adulterated with fentanyl. Here in, in California, they had 56 cases last year and 15 fatalities from the same thing. People are going out there buying their pills for their back pain, and they're dying because they got fentanyl. They present with an exaggerated opioid overdose in cardiac arrest, CPR requir requiring intubation, needing repeat naloxone doses or prolonged naloxone infusions. 
Um, and all these cases here, by the way, did have forensic, all these, um, these um, deaths had forensic evidence of, uh, of uh, positive fentanyl on their drug screens. There's your counterfeit oxy again. And the pills were tested and were positive. So that brings me to some uh, historical stuff of heroin epidemics in recent history. So the one that's happening now is not the only one. So if you go back all the way to, Cal to 1979 in California, there was methyl alpha methyl fentanyl was killing a bunch of people in California. It was called China White. It was essentially substituted for heroin. It was not even mixed with heroin. It was pure alpha methyl fentanyl, and people were just dying from it. Philly and Pittsburgh, same thing, almost 10 years later, 3-methyl fentanyl. Again, a very potent uh, fentanyl that was substituted for heroin. In New York in 1990, there was, it was called Tango and Cash, which was fentanyl, was now mixed with heroin. The manufacturers of these, of these heroines, uh, these uh, street drugs now became wise, and they said, we're killing off our population, our, our buying, our uh, consumer, so we have to be careful as to how much of this stuff we put in the heroin. And so they started mixing it uh, with and without heroin. And we had a huge epidemic. Some of the staff may remember um, a little over 10 years ago, we had here Detroit, Chicago, and the Philly area. Altogether, there were greater than 1,000 deaths due to fentanyl. Um, and uh, whoops. I thought I had my, all right. So anyway, that's not the, not the only epidemic that, that we've had. Uh, is now. It's, they've been coming and going like every 10 years. This is another synthetic opioid. It's called U4770. It's a potent opioid immune receptor uh, agonist, eight times the potency of morphine. It's not as potent as acetyl fentanyl and its, and its analogs, and it's much shorter acting. And actually, there right now, if, you can buy it on the internet. You can just purchase it. You can go and bring it up, and you can buy it for 35 You can buy a certain amount of pills or powder for 35 or $40. So if you want a check, you can do that. It's often called pink. <laughs> it's often called pink because the tablets are pink. The, 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 um, the powders tend to have, a, not all of them, but tend to have a pink view, and, and it's often abbreviated as called U4. Um, recently, there were 46 deaths in North Carolina and New York that were related to this U4. Again, mostly put in pills and sold as counterfeit pills. And case reports are showing up daily in every new journal, monthly journal that comes out. There's new case reports. So going back to our heroin epidemic uh, 10 years ago, look at this. This is all medical examiner data. Between September 2005 and November 2006, there were 218 medical examiner cases that were proven, proven to be heroin, adulterate, heroin and a very few of cocaine adulterated with illicit fentanyl. That's the toll it took. Again, the manufacturer was just like slopping fentanyl and they're not thinking they're going to kill or they're, he, he, she is going to kill their yeah. consumer. Okay, I'm <laughs> politically incorrect that they are going to kill their consumer by, you know, not, not proportionalizing what they're doing. So we had a lot of deaths here. Some were in Oakland and Macomb County, but 218 cases. So moving on to the next synthetic, does anybody remember the Moscow Theater disaster? 2002, you probably were babies then when you were, you were just born. <laughs> I forget, that's how many years ago? That's like 15 years ago. All right, so you were in high school or something. All right, so that when, the, in, when the Chechen rebels seized a Moscow theater to prove their political cause in, tw in 20, uh, 2002, they took 900 hostages. Here's the theater. Um, and they, uh, the Russian government then trying to get out of the situation after trying whatever tried, they tried. Um, they pumped gas into the theater, and it turned out, it was not known at first what it was, it turned out to be carfentanil gas. Nobody knew you could vaporize carfentanil. It's always been a liquid or a powder, or, and uh, they, for the first time, used carfentanil gas. They put everybody to sleep, like Sleeping Beauty, and many of those people died. Here's a picture of people in the theater. These are probably the terrorists, but there are many people. Terrorists died, and many people that were attending the theater died. Um, and there were 170 fatalities. And what was terrible about this was that they didn't notify their medical systems what they were going to do. So p when the patients started arriving first, they had small pupils. They were out. What do you think they thought they had? Nobody knew you could vaporize carfentanil. 
What do you, small pupils, unconscious, what does that sound like? What toxidrome would you think of? What other toxidrome besides opiate gives you small pupils? Cholinergic. So they thought it was nerve gas. They thought it was some kind of VX, you know, which was popular, is popular in terms of terrorists, and they weren't prepared. They didn't have enough naloxone, and so they could have, you know, it is said retrospectively that many more people could have been saved had the medical systems known and tried to save some of them with naloxone, but they didn't. So this was a terrible, uh, terrible disaster. Oop, what am I doing? Yeah, I don't know what I did here. I put my... Whoops, no. Okay. No, I went backwards. Okay. Okay. All right, so what is carfentanil? Carfentanil is another synthetic opioid, again, a very strong mu, mu a receptor agonist. It is a derivative of fentanyl. It is 10,000 times the potency of morphine and 100 times the potency of fentanyl. It is a large... It is actually scheduled. It is made pharmaceutically as well as illegally because it is a large animal anesthetic for elephants and moose and horses and things like that. It can be absorbed both dermally, orally, mucous membranes, IV or inhaled and has a longer elimination half-life than, than fentanyl. And it comes now, it's used in liquid, in counterfeit capsules and in powder. The chemicals again are thought to come from China through this dark net that we were talking about. Um, and it is now showing its head here in Michigan. It is showing up in other cities. You saw that initially when I showed you the drugs that people are dying from, carfentanil was only 6%, but it's potentially um, coming, and we've see, we think we've seen it in the emergency department, and I'll show you the cases. So um, it is a large an animal anesthetic, and this shows you the proportion that one elephant weighing f five to 14,000 pounds uh, compared to the weight of an average male, and you know, you're trying to give them carfentanil, and you can see how potent the amounts are, are and the potency of this agent. Since July, there are confirmed deaths um, in Ohio and our surrounding states, overdoses and deaths, um, and since August uh, 2016, confirmed uh, overdoses in Michigan, and drug is seized in, by the Michigan State Police. There is a risk to first responders, in case you don't know this, that carfentanil can actually be, as I said, inhaled, could come through the skin. So um, there is a big DEA warning locally and throughout the nation that if first responders or even you are in the hospital, if there is a powder, you need to wear full protective gear because responders and police have been getting toxic and dropping from this stuff just by inhaling it not by touching the patient, but by inhaling the, you know, the, the powder. So you should always wear universal precautions when you're dealing with them, but if you have an obvious powder, they recommend nitrile gloves and a N95 or 100 respirator, et cetera. There's no clinical test no, on, the, on the humans to uh, confirm this right now. They have some forensic testing available, but the sample of drugs are important to uh, track these. This is a case we had just a few months ago, not even, oh, I'm sorry, a few weeks ago. This is how we suspect them in the emergency department. This is a 28-year-old male who presented um, after he was found unresponsive in a car. He received four milligrams of naloxone in, intranasally with no response. He arrived to the ER with respirations of six, cyanotic, 60 heart rate. He was bagged, and in the, he was bagged, bagged to, you know, maintain his um, oxygenation, and he was then given uh, a total of seven milligrams of naloxone IV, and he awakened. It was getting pretty look, looking like he was going to need to be intubated, but he actually awakened. I mean, he admitted to shooting heroin that he had been going to Narcotics Anonymous, but had a relapse. He had some other problems here, was going to be admitted. This was his initial blood gas. Chest x-ray showed no findings. He was going to be admitted, AKI, possible um, uh, liver enzyme elevations for whatever reason, and uh, but he decided to leave AMA, which is, a, again, a typical, once they get better, kind of like Dr. Bowles, hello, just like our 70s heroin addicts that used to get better, and all of a sudden they're gone. They, you want to keep them, you want to observe them, whatever, but they're gone, they left AMA. So this is the kind of patient that we suspect 
um, carfentanil in now. Okay, we, we got the heroin fentanyl down. They usually respond to a standard dose of naloxone, but our clinical suspicion is with an opioid toxidrome that doesn't respond to the standard naloxone doses. Um, we had in the fall last year both here and at DRH and at Sinai Grace, there were multiple patients seen that looked like an opiate overdose, um, but they needed up to 6 to 10 milligrams of naloxone to get to be awakened. Uh, they were getting pre-hospital intranasal. Intranasal is usually uh, two, uh, two or four. It's four milligrams usually if it's the atomizer. Um, some of the ones that were not shooting at IV but were just snorting it were presenting with syncope after snorting what they thought was a small amount of heroin, so very potent stuff. And we also suspected in a patient who's re-narcotized after, after a couple hours of getting naloxone having recurrence of symptoms. Well, this is an old school heroin overdose. Patient comes cyanotic, hypoventilating, meiosis has track marks. Most people now use, majority of people are snorting and uh, using different way than IV, thank goodness. But um, clothes were soaking wet. This patient responded to 0.4 naloxone, started to get withdrawal symptoms of shivering, pyloerection, vomiting. So at the time, we rarely see this anymore, right, Manny? We hardly ever see them coming. Sometimes they come in wet. But this used to be the street smart revival. They would throw them outside in the ice when they overdosed. They would pack them in ice or put ice on the testicles. <laughs> it was all to awaken them. And then there was some, for a while, there was milk, pouring milk down somebody's throat was supposed to neutralize the poison. Um, and some people even tried to inject milk into people with this idea that milk is neutralizing agents, so a lot of aspiration and other complications. So this, we, we luckily don't see this as much anymore. We're focused on using naloxone uh, as opposed to these type of, of interventions. Um, so adulterated heroin, aside from the synthetics that we talked about, which is which the fentanyl analogs, the U47700, the carfentanil, which is the big one now, uh, there's still regular heroin is still around, and there's still adulterated. There are still situations where heroin is adulterated, means it's intentionally uh, adulterated to reduce either the content of active drug or to add to the effect of the drug. And so fentanyl analogs, and these guys we talked about. Scopolamine was, uh, at one point, like 20 years ago, was contaminating heroin on the East Coast. They would get Narcan, all of a sudden they get an anticholinergic toxidrome, and, uh, and it was determined that it was scopolamine, for whatever reason, was contaminating the heroin. Clenbuterol, which is a beta agonist, same thing, there was a little rash of, of uh, a series of cases about 10 years ago on the East Coast. Again, they would get naloxone, wake up, and then they would manifest this hypotension um, and tachycardia, and I'm going to say something about that in a minute, and it was a beta agonist toxidrome. Cocaine is often adulterated. Cheese heroin was heroin mixed with diphenhydramine, uh, sedatives. This is a case of, I don't know, do we have, uh, you had that case? Okay. So we had just uh, last, just a year ago, exactly, May or April last year, three patients came to the ED, drove themselves, 19, 21, and 25. They had injected a substance that they thought was heroin. They drove all the way from Ohio to get some kind of special heroin. Um, and within minutes of injecting, they had, they had palpitations, chest pain, dizziness, shortness of breath, vomiting. They never got sedated. They remained tachycardic, and they got very hypotensive. And they got a whole bunch of fluid for refractory hypotension. They were hypokalemic, hypomagnesemic, sugars were high, lactate was high. Um, they did, all of them had a version of dynamic ST depressions and all had QT prolongation, which might have been related to this potassium and magnesium. And they were all positive for opiates, cocaine, and THC. But they had a, what, what to us toxicologists is a classic beta agonist toxidrome, which is similar to theophylline caffeine, which is hypotension, tachycardia, with hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, <coughs> hyperglycemia, uh, and often uh, elevated lactate, but you know, lactate comes for many reasons, especially if they're hypotensive. Uh, all three, three weeks later, we had a confirmation. We sent their, their urine for clenbuterol. They all three had the presence of clenbuterol. So, and so th we were looking, we had a surveillance out. Are there going to be more cases? We never had more cases than those three. These young people were young. They tolerated this, uh, these uh, changes to develop pulmonary edema, but they, anyway, they signed out AMA. They didn't want to, they didn't, uh, 
they had echo, two of them had an echo done, and the echo was unremarkable. They did not show a stress cardiomyopathy. And so, so beta agonist toxidrome adulterating heroin with clenbuterol has been widely documented cases of, of causing an end STEMI in young patients with normal coronary arteries. Uh, diluents, so they're adulterants and they're diluents which usually have no pharmacologic action. What is chasing the dragon? Has anybody heard of that? You've Good, so you inhale the smoke, but you, the special thing, the special, the special part of this is that they do it on aluminum foil. They burn the heroin, uh, they vaporize the heroin on aluminum foil. It happens only in, in people who do it this particular way, very popular in Europe. Many, many cases became evident there, but it's done all over the world, is um, heroin heated on aluminum foil. They don't know, they still have not determined, is it a product of pyrolysis or the aluminum or what? They have not determined it, but it causes after several uses, it can cause a very bad spongiform leukoencephalopathy with cerebellar and cerebral white matter destruction due to mitochondrial dysfunction, and patients wind up mute, bradykinetic, spastic quadriparesis, uh, and it's a, it's a terrible uh, reaction, and that's what, and, and you chase the dragon as the smoke goes, you, you, sm you uh, inhale it through there. So now let's say a few words about the I'm going back to my, my metabolic schema here because we're going to talk a little bit about lab. All right, so I showed you that morphine is like the mother, and uh, codeine can go to morphine. This is only a one-way reaction, and heroin is synthesized exogenously from morphine, uh, and then it's deacetylated to 6-MAM and then back to morphine. And this is what anything that's similar to morphine on your urine tox screens that are immunoassays, is going to potentially can give you a positive, and anything that isn't, or depending on the quantity, will not. So, so which which of these? Because we get this kind of question all the time. Well, you know, but it's toxic. So what? You go to your clinical picture. The patient has a, a opioid toxidrome. You give them naloxone. Uh, blah, 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 there's times where naloxone uh, doesn't completely reverse them, which we'll mention, but basically you go by that, you don't go by your screen, okay? Ta a positive screen for anything only indicates exposure. It doesn't necessarily indicate intoxication, right? So the morphine structure is the basis of all these immunoassays, not the GCMS and the bigger screens, but the ones you use. So the natural opiate, opiates like morphine codeine will al always give you positive heroin, even though it's a semi-synthetic will give you positive because it's converted to morphine. And then the semi-synthetic opioids, which are like hydrocodone, hydromorphone, these guys here, it's very variable. You very often do not have a positive screen because even though they are, the raw material that they made from is codeine and morphine, still it, um, codeine and thebane, still uh, quantity makes a huge difference. So the, the sensitivity of the immunoassays for uh, semi-synthetic opioids is variable and depends on the assay sensitivity and on drug concentration. And the synthetics, like carfentanil, fentanyl, methadone, they do not show up at all on that screen. This is right from our own lab. I asked the lab director to send me this. What is the sensitivity of our opiate uh, immunoassay, which is all calibrated against morphine? Um, and these are all the semi-synthetics. And this is like a minimum concentration that you have to have to trip the screen. So look at these here. Codeine, okay, it's pretty low, dihydrocodeine. Look at hydromor hydrocodone. And look at all these, how much you need. Meperidine is not a semi-synthetic, that's air. Look at um, oxycodone. You need like 1,500 nanograms or, uh, per ml so that, uh, so that you can see how some of them, the concentration has to be really big. So basically, when you look at an opioid screen that's an immunoassay, an acute urine tox screen, you should remember that the only thing that's going to definitely give you something positive is your morphine coating heroin. And all the other stuff is, depends on the amount and is unlikely to be positive. So you go by your clinical picture. And the actual um, synthetics like fentanyl, etc., there is now a, a test, it's not clinically available, as some ELISA test for fentanyl and can be confirmed by GCMS, done only in special labs. Um, and of course, the medical examiner can do some things and the, the drug testing itself can give it. But otherwise, we do not have any clinically available tests for these. So what, what are the situations where you give naloxone 
and you don't get a response. You have an opiate tox toxidrome, but it doesn't respond to the standard, appropriately to the standard doses of naloxone. You, what should you think of? You should always think of a mixed overdose, right? Because you could have a bunch of Xanax or Valium or some other antidepressant or something with your heroin, so you're not going to completely awaken. Clonidine, as you know, it looks identical to an opioid. It has small pupils. Everything is similar. So we always think about clonidine when we have no response to not naloxone. We should always think of our high-potency opioids, which we just talked about today, fentanyl, carfentanil, fentanyl. And then patient that might have suffered too much uh, hypoxia and may have an anoxic encephalopathy, which they may not wake up from. So there are situations that we think about when we have that. So what about the dose of naloxone? Everybody in the toxicology world is talking about the dose of naloxone. Um, the uh, naloxone dosing depends on the dose and the binding affinity of the agonist at the, at the mu receptor. Um, it is, it is an antagonist to the mu receptor and to the effects of the mu receptor. The goal of treating somebody with naloxone is to adequately ventilate them without causing withdrawal. That can be easier said than done sometimes, but basically in the days in the 70s and 80s, we used to just whop people with two milligrams of naloxone and then they would start vomiting and withdraw and, and, and get their pulmonary edema or whatever, whether it was from that or not. And over the years, um, it has, this has been very tamed back and uh, most toxicologists, emergency physicians, and there is, they, they, they have done looking at the literature, looking at expert consensus, support using low dose naloxone when you approach these patients. Now there's two kinds of low dose. One is, in, I'm talking IV right now, because the intranasal preparations, they're all set pre-made at either two or four milligrams, but their absorption isn't as good as IV. So a, a, a regular low dose would be 0.4 milligrams, which is the, the one, the 0.4 milligram vial. But most people, if you think the patient is opioid dependent, will start even lower with a 0.02 or 0.04 milligrams, and then escalate it up every two to five minutes to 0 0.4, 0 .0, 0 .0, up to two milligrams, and then if nothing happens, then if we think, then you're starting to think, okay, this is a synthetic opioid, so now you can do two milligrams all the way up to 10 milligrams. After 10 milligrams, there's really no utility. Um, if you take a, this is a 0.4 milligram vial. If you dilute it with 10, 10 cc's of saline, you have 0.04 milligrams per ml. So that's what we generally do is start in that, in that vein and then titrate it up rather than, than whop them with the big dose. But many people still use this as, a sink, as the first dose, but more recommended is the 0.04 per kg and then titrate it up. Um, the infusion, there's a way to give the infusion, which is not necessarily given through here, but there is a formula for it if you ever want to know. So um, what are some of the adverse effects of naloxone? Well, um, again, withdrawal is one of the biggest, and vomiting and aspiration, and then this potential excess uh, catechol release uh, that could either lead to myocardial ischemia in the right kind of patient or heart failure or even non-cardiac pulmonary edema if there is any uh, direct, may, there may not be a direct relationship to it, but it may be uh, indirectly related. These are the products out there that are being used by the lay public of naloxone. This is an auto-injector. It, it's voice-activated speaker. You pull it apart and the speaker tells you exactly what to do, kind of like an AED device, so that it's foolproof. Um, this is the one that our EMS carries. It's like a nasal atomizer, so they have to put it together. They put this cartridge in here of, um, of the naloxone, and then they stick this little cone in the nose, and that's how they give it. And then this one is the newest one, is a nasal spray. And this one, of course, is more expensive, and the auto-injector is expensive. Here are some prices. They're a little bit old, but you can see that the auto-injector is a lot more expensive than than uh, something like this or just pulling it out of a vial. But for the lay public, you can't chance that error. Uh, so there has to be something that's pre-made. What do we do as far as disposition of these patients, though? You know, our heroin patients, uh, years ago, they used to say admit. When I was a medical student, everybody got admitted for heroin at receiving. They would come in, and our can was just coming out, and they'd always, oh, they're going to get delayed pulmonary edema it's up to 24 hours. Over the years, that didn't pan out. We started to say, okay, observe them 12 hours, then 8 hours. And now kind of the general idea is, you know, that the patient's going to be hypoxic within the first four hours. And uh, if they have no symptoms, if they're awake and they stay awake, and you think um, it, it took a standard amount of naloxone, you think it's heroin, that there's, um, there are reports supporting 
large scale reports supporting that those patients, if they want to leave, they can leave in an hour. Um, and there's very little um, um, bad, they're very low risk for bad outcomes. Um, in Europe, apparently, they just let them go on the scene. Here, our EMS guys constantly kind of convince them to come to the hospital, uh, et cetera, because that's the standard, the way we practice. But, but in lieu of, all these here are, were kind of on the background of large-scale uh, regular heroin, but in lieu of this new epidemic, the expert opinion is that we should try. We should try to keep these patients for at least two to four hours because Narcan duration of effect is about 90 minutes, and it can be a little bit longer sometimes, too. So, and then, uh, and, and then they can resedate. So generally speaking, if the patient is agreeable, is not signing out AMA, or you don't have to restrain them, if, they're, if you determine that they are, uh, have capacity to make their own judgment, and you, you can't you know, talk them out of it, then uh, they can leave. But we usually try to keep people in, in that range of two to four hours, unless they were um, very delayed response or have other, uh, they didn't return to their baseline. So there's been, there's a shortened period of observation, but now we're going to a longer period of observation with these synthetics as, as uh, we have many unknowns. So sort of to summarize, although this isn't the last slide, but almost, we have to maintain a high clinical suspicion for synthetic opioids when the opioid toxidrome is not responding to standard naloxone doses. You do good supportive bag mass ventilation before you reverse them. Uh, maintain a good stock of naloxone and start low. Titrate from low dose 0.04 up, uh, up to 10. If there's no response after 10, forget it. Partial respon responses to naloxone uh, or even delayed responses are the, uh, suggest the things we just talked about, co-ingested sedatives, synthetics, or clonidine. Um, remember that synthetics are not detected in the urine drug, drug screen. We tend to want to observe them in the emergency department for two to four hours. If they resedate, we suggest admitting them. Use universal precautions and um, personal protective equipment that's heavier if there's a powder present because you can inhale it. And report cases to the poison center. There is no mandatory reporting, but it is very important for epidemiologic purposes. And that's probably your most uh, go-to place uh, to, to call is the Poison Center. We keep track of all these. We give all that information to Michigan Department of Community Health and State Police. And if you do have any samples on the patient, you should surrender them to security officers so that they can give them to the Michigan State or to the State Police. So last, last thing here, okay? Toxic torsad. Remember we said which two Opioids can cause QT prolongation and torsad, that was methadone and loperamide, which seems like a nothing drug, but has become very popular now, okay? Um, so this, this was a patient we had at poison control last year, an outside hospital. Heroin user presented with recurrent syncope, and uh, he was awake, hypotensive, tachycardic, um, his QRS on his EKG was 650, QTC, excuse me, QTC was 650. And he kept having recurrent episodes of torsad, which was refractory to lidocaine, magnesium, bicarb, repeated defibrillations. Um, cardiologists there, we thought they would, uh, they would overdrive pace him, but the cardiologist said, just start him on isoprotonol. So he, he put him, which we haven't, like, I don't even know if we carry isoprotonol, but they had it. And they put him on isoprotonol, and um, he stabilized on isoprotonol. Yes, a year ago, there was somebody using isoprotonol. But anyway, so it caused the same thing as overdrive pacing with causing severe tachycardia, right, which narrows the QT interval. Um, the urine tox screen was negative, including methadone, and he was not on methadone. Um, and he admitted then to taking four to 500 milligrams of loperamide daily for two weeks for opiate withdrawal because he was a, a heroin addict and he couldn't get any other, he wanted to, to stop his withdrawal symptoms, didn't want to go back to using, didn't have any access to substitution therapy with methadone or suboxone. So people do this, people actually do this. They take lots and lots of loperamide, imodium, and it's out there on the internet and they even have sophisticated enough formulas that they, they in addition to using um, loperamide, they actually use them with glyco P-glycoprotein transport inhibitors because that's what keeps 
the uh, loperamide outside the brain. So here we go. Loperamide abuse is increasing as an alternative for treatment of opiate withdrawal. Uh, and there's been a warning release that it causes these cardiotoxic effects by the FDA. In super therapeutic doses, it causes cardiac dysrhythmias, both torsad and, uh, and regular VTAC. And uh, usually this is a, it affects the peripheral mu receptor in the GI tract and it doesn't penetrate the blood-brain barrier in low doses because of this uh, gly uh, P-glycoprotein transporter prevents it to move into the brain. But high doses overcome that effect, you saturate this P-glycoprotein transporter and then it gets into the blood-brain barrier and so they get some effect, euphoric effect from that as well and it helps cut down on some, on their, some of their symptoms. Um, and so they recommend on the internet to use it for withdrawal in conjunction with a glycoprotein inhibitor to help this, which quinine and quinidine are the most common ones. Um, and what does it do? I mean, basically, uh, it affects the QT interval as all others do by affecting the voltage-gated potassium channel, prolonging the QT and causing these dysrhythmias. And that's it for now. Any questions?